had to pick something out to play, so I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, we've been so blessed to have special music in this church for years. We've had the clarinets and the accordions, and we've had the trombones, and the, the tuba, which I remember sitting here in the corner all the time that Ben Polish played. Um, but probably 50 years when I was in my teens here every Sunday going to church, there was one lady who lived across the street who had a baby grand piano and came to our church and she did special music several times. Some of you know her, some of you don't. Her name was June Cates. And this is a song, His Eye is on the Sparrow, that she played and sang several times. And that's what I remember. So that's what I played today. No mics and no guitars, just the piano. <laughs>
It's a wonderful reference that we say from time to time because we love it when plans come together, right? We plan a vacation. We plan to remodel the hall. We plan to get a new job or whatever our plans might be. When things fall into place, yes, there might be a few tweaks here and there, but when things happen the way we expected them to happen, we're excited and we just, I love it when things work out. God has and has had a plan to save sinners. That's a good place for an amen. God has and has had a plan to save sinners. Amen. All right. And that plan has been carried out and continues to be carried out exactly as he has determined it to happen. All the rebellion and sin and evil in the world and their consequences can't stop God's plan. Another spot for it. Amen. Amen. As we have learned over the past few weeks, even the sinful choices of Satan and people have been used by God, utilized by God, to bring about good and honor and glory for Him. Today we're going to look at the best thing that could ever happen to sinners. We've talked about the worst thing that could ever happen to sinners, that people would be eternally judged in hell forever. We've talked about the bad things that happen to believers and unbelievers for the past couple of weeks. And these things are awful, but they are not the worst thing, and the best thing is yet to come. That is God's salvation for sinners. This has been God's plan for a long, long time, as we're going to see here in just a moment. And he is worthy of our praise and worship for it. So this morning, I want us to see that this passage of Scripture is about praising God, who has blessed us because it pleased Him to do so for His glory. These verses are incredibly awesome verses. I mean, the, it, it's so compact with truth that you can't even really organize it in some logical way because it's so intermixed and so many different themes are here together and you can't talk about one without talking about the other. And So this might seem a little like Pastor Andy's just kind of all over the place. That's because this passage is all over the place. Because the author, Paul, when he wrote it, when he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this letter to the churches of Ephesus, he was in awe of what God has done for sinners. And he just starts out praising God. This is a doxology. This is like a praise song at the beginning of a letter to the church in Ephesus. And it's packed full of truth, really good deep, personal truth. And you can't not read this and not say hallelujah or amen because it's just so awesome that God would save sinners. According to chapter 2, we were dead in our transgressions and sins. We had no hope except for God's grace towards us. That is, we're going to look at it in a minute. He would save some through Christ. We cannot not praise God. And so that's what happens here. We are praising God who has blessed us because it pleased Him to do so for His glory. God has blessed us. In fact, it starts out with Paul saying, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because this is a praise. He is saying praise to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ because He is so awesome. He is so good. He is so gracious. He is so worthy of all of that we can give him. Because he has blessed us in so many ways. And that's part of the main idea of this passage. How God has blessed us. He says that he has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And that's kind of what I'm using as an outline today. How has he blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ? What does that look like? What has he told us here is, are these blessings? These are spiritual blessings. These are not material blessings. This is not stuff that you can pick up with your hands, like paper or, or uh, money or a house. You know, those are blessings that God has given us. But these blessings that Paul talks about, these far outweigh any other blessing that we could get. Because these are eternal blessings. These are blessings that affect us forever and affect us down to the very core being who we are. Because we were once dead in our sins. But now we are made alive in Christ Jesus because of what God has done. 
these blessings are of heavenly origin because God is in heaven. And before time began, He came up with this plan. This plan that we are so thankful has been carried out and fulfilled in great success because, of course, it's God. And he always has success. So what are these spiritual blessings? Well, we're going to start in verse 4 with the most controversial of blessings of all. For He chose us in Him before the creation of the world. He chose us. Chosen before the creation of the world. This is key for us because it shows that no believer was chosen because of anything that they did or didn't do. Before there was any ever anybody to choose, they were chosen. I know that doesn't make a lot of sense, but when you're eternal and you can think into eternity that hasn't even happened yet, you know, you can do that. Eklego, and I'm probably killing that pronunciation means to choose or select for oneself, to give favor to that which is chosen in the form of a relationship. Now, far too often we look at this word and we think, I've been chosen. And that's good because that's true, you have been chosen. But that's not the point. The point is not individual. The point is all those who are in Christ, all those who have believed in Christ, have been chosen. So this is a communal type thing here. This is the church of Jesus Christ that is being talked about here. Every believer in Christ has been chosen by God. God chose sinners in Christ, and He chose for a reason. Not just because, you know, just picking and choosing, but for a reason. That we would be holy and blameless in His sight. Because He knew the fall was going to happen. So He chose us to be holy and blameless, but He knew that we couldn't do that apart from Christ. And so He chose us. He graciously reached out, offered in kindness to us, so that we could be holy and blameless in Christ. And He did this in love. That word love, that we spent so many weeks last fall looking at, that selfless giving for the benefit of others. He did what was best for us before we even knew what we did. That's how amazing that's a reason for praising Him and blessing Him because He has chosen to save sinners in Christ. But there's more. Verse 5. For He chose us in Him for the Christian who was be holy and blameless in His sight. In love, verse 5, He predestined us to be adopted as His sons through Jesus Christ. Predestined. We looked at this a couple weeks ago. It means predetermined. God predetermined to choose to save sinners in Christ. So he chose sinners according to his predetermined plan to save sinners in Christ, before there was actually even a need to save sinners. This involves purpose. God had a plan, and throughout this passage you see it quite often, purpose, plan, will. All of that works together. We're going to focus on some of that this morning, but not each specific instance. But God had a desire, he had a plan, and he carried it out. He was determined to do it. The purpose for choosing, for predestining, for predetermining, for making a plan is so that we would be holy and blameless as his children. And so we are adopted, Paul says. Adopted. Verse 5, I need your blessings. He predestined us to be adopted as his sons, as his children, through Jesus Christ. In Christ, we now can become a part of the family of God. Yes, we are children of God by the fact that we are all created by God. But there's a deeper relationship than just that. In Christ, we are united together with the one whom God loves more than any His son. We are his children. Now there is a special relationship with those who have believed in who have been chosen by God to be saved from their sins. Sinners have a relationship with Him because He predetermined the plan to adopt sinners by choosing to save some in Christ. And too often we get hung up here on the thought of some being chosen and some not. And never stop to think that none had to be chosen at all. We were never created or destined for hell. That was created because of Satan and his fallen angels. But when sin entered into the human race, it's all it's the only place for sinners to go. For those who continually reject God's favor, God's grace, reject his Messiah Jesus. 
there is condemnation, there is judgment for eternity. Instead of debating and griping about something so wonderful that it is truly too comprehensive, it's too much to comprehend. I don't know all the ins and outs about why God did what He did. I just know that He did it. And the Scriptures constantly give Him praise and glory for doing it. And I'm so glad He did, because I want to be with Him for eternity and not without Him for eternity. So let us follow the example of the Apostle Paul and not worry about all the details that we really don't know about just take the word as it is and when it says that we have been adopted, when we've been predestined when we've been chosen, if we have faith in Christ, according to God's plan, let us say hallelujah I am saved and praise God for our salvation because we have been redeemed according to verse 7, and if you think I'm skipping over part of 5 and 6, I am, we're going to get there verse 7, all of that is because in Him, in Christ, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. The original word here, redeemed, means deliverance. To be delivered from something. To set somebody free. Kind of like how Egypt, or Israel was delivered from Egypt. We have been delivered from sin. It's like in a hostage situation on TV. The police always wait to hear about the ransom demands. What is it going to take to deliver the hostage? Well, we know what it took to deliver us, the hostages, to sin. It took Jesus' death upon the cross. A sinless man dying for sinful people. In this passage and throughout the scriptures, the problem is that God's highest creation is held captive by the power and consequences of sin. And according to verse 2, that means that we're dead to anything spiritual. According to chapter 2, excuse me. There's nothing in us that would ever want to have anything to do with God until God acts somehow on our behalf to awaken us to want to know Him and to trust and believe in Christ and to be saved. God in Jesus, the God-man, the one true, holy, and blameless human, willingly gave His life to die for those who deserved it when He did not. The reference here to blood recalls the Old Testament sacrifices that pointed to the ultimate sacrifice for sin, Christ on the cross. It's in Christ that we stand before God, holy and blameless as His children, even as we continue to mess things up even after our faith in Christ. Yes, we're going to struggle with sin. Even the Apostle Paul struggled with sin. If he can struggle with sin and deal with it and move on and trust by faith that God has not forgotten him, not tossed him aside, we can continue to move forward in faith, that God has not tossed us aside just because we have messed up one day. We're in Christ. We are holy and blameless in His sight. And that's how God sees us. This word redeemed is in the original language and somewhat carried out here in the English. It's to be an ongoing thing. We are delivered, continually delivered from the power and the presence and the consequences of sin. Because of Christ. That is a great reason to praise God. That is a wonderful blessing to receive from God. And this is all a part of His plan, all a part of His revealed will. Look with me at verse 9. And He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure, which He purposed in Christ. His revealed will, this grand predetermined plan of redemption of saving sinners, has been revealed to us. And there's an even greater mystery to it than that. It's because there was an aspect of this plan of redemption that wasn't known before. There was a, a part of it that was supposed to include all people, not just the Jewish people, but all people, together in what is now known as the church. And God has decided to share that with the apostles and shared it with all that they proclaimed the gospel message to. Something not fully revealed in the past, but given in the present age, and we shall see that it involves bringing all people together under Christ. Because there has been a rebellion, and now there's much of the world that is trying to live apart from the authority of Christ. And God's like, no, no, that's not how the way things are going to end up. Everyone will eventually bow the knee to Christ. Some willingly. The inheritance of Eternal life is for those who will believe. 
And that's part of God's plan for us. As we look at verses 13 and 14 at the end, another great blessing of being in Christ, another spiritual blessing from heaven is the Holy Spirit. You also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed in Him, you were marked in Him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. To the praise of His glory. The Holy Spirit. God within us. Guiding us, leading us, convicting us. Teaching us through the word. It's a seal, it's a guarantee, it's a deposit. You are mine. If you ever doubt it, just ask for assurance and look to the Word and the Spirit will remind you that you belong to God. And while we have yet to receive even the physical, full physical aspects of our salvation, He within us is a deposit guarantee. The rest is coming. Just wait. God is faithful. God is true. You can depend on Him. Even if you mess up, listen to the Spirit and He says, ah, oh, you need to repent of that. Repent of that. Confess it and move on in faith. For those of us who have believed in the gospel truth, we are given a promise. We're not yet all that God has declared us to be, but it is coming. Hang on. Don't let go. The Spirit of God is our seal, our guarantee that God will fulfill His promises. The inheritance of eternal life, of our full adoption, being physically realized, ruling and reigning with Christ, all of these things that are promised to us will happen. He's given us His Spirit as a way of saying, Here's a little foretaste. Here's a preview of what is to come. Ever wonder why God would do all of that? Why would God go to all that trouble to save wicked, rebellious sinners? Well, there's a reason. Because He wanted to. It pleased Him. Let's look at verse 5 and 6 and 9 and 10 and 11 real quickly. Just look at these where it says it, just, it pleased Him. The end of verse 5. He predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. The end of verse 9. According to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. In verse 10. To be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. Verse 11, in Him we were chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of Him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of His will. Why did God go to the trouble of saving sinners? And really, it's not much trouble on His part, but why did He do this? Because it pleased Him. He had a delightful plan. God's thelema. And again, I'm probably butchering that phrase or that pronunciation, but His determined choice or his inclination to do something pleasing for himself. It pleased him. It made him happy to save sinners. God's plan is his will, his determination, his expression of doing something that creates joy. God purposed to save sinners in Christ because the idea and the execution of that idea brought and brings him great joy. And he gets to showcase his son. And that brings him joy. Does it not bring you joy when you get to say, hey, did you hear what my son or daughter or my granddaughter or grandson did? God gets to do that every time the gospel is proclaimed. Look at my son. I am so pleased with him. Look at what he has done for sinners. And look at how they worship him and bring him glory. He is pleased to save sinners in Christ. The whole point is truly to highlight and magnify his son or Savior. This plan carried out in Christ. God has freely given us His favor. It pleased Him to favor us, to favor sinners who would believe in His Son, who do believe in His Son, delivering us through Him. It gives Him joy. Do you find joy in some of the work that you do? I know some of it is a pain. But there is joy sometimes in the things that we do. God finds joy in His work of saving sinners. Part of that plan that brings him joy is to bring everything together under Christ. To unite everyone and everything in Christ. Now this is not talking about universal salvation or anything like that. It's talking about universal reign. Uh, Jesus will be king over everything and everyone. And we long for that day. 
Everything has always been about working everything in everyone's life so that Christ would be the one in charge, that he would get the honor and glory. In verse 11, when it says, we were chosen having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, he's specifically talking to everything he just talked about in verses 3 through 10, about saving sinners, blessing them spiritually, bringing everything together in Christ. That's the number one purpose, the number one reason for why we have been predestined and chosen. But it also means the great details of our lives as well. Everything is being worked together by God. This is like the Romans 8, 28, 29 verse of Ephesians. Everything is being brought together so that we would be conformed to the image of Christ. So that we would be under the reign of Christ. God has chosen, predestined, adopted, redeemed and guarantee his plan of salvation because it brings him joy. And I am so glad God is happy today because that means that I have been blessed and can be a blessing. And he did it all, not just for his joy, not just because it pleased, it pleased him, but it brings him glory, for his glory. We've been looking at the past couple weeks on Wednesday nights about what it means to bring God glory. What does glory mean? And really it means to have a high opinion of someone, to have an opinion of someone. Usually in the scriptures it means a high opinion of someone. But their reputation, what you say of someone. So if we were to say like, hey, I want to introduce you to this person, and you tell them all the wonderful things about that person, because you want the person you're introducing them to to think highly of them. You are glorifying them. When we say, hey, the Packers had a really good season, even though they lost last week, we're glorifying the Packers to an extent. When we glorify God, when God brings himself glory, that's a good thing. We might say, well, isn't that selfish? No, because there's no higher thing for God to give glory to than himself. If he were to glorify anything else, that would be a bad thing. He brings glory to himself and to his name because there is no higher, greater thing to bring glory to. And it happens because of his grace and his faithfulness to us. Look again at verses 6 through 8 as we see his glory here. To the praise of His glorious grace. His grace is glorious. His grace to us brings Him fame. It makes Him famous. Which He has freely given us in the one that He loves. Again, He loves to magnify and glorify His Son, Jesus. In Him we have redemption. For at the end of verse 7 there, with the, according to the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us with all wisdom, He lavished His grace on us. That means He just took a huge bucket of grace and just poured it out all over everybody. And then He grabbed another bucket and poured it all out over again. And He grabbed another bucket and He's got a quadrillion, million buckets of grace. Never ending grace. And He loves to just pick it up and throw it out. Kind of like the coach gets dumped with Gatorade. God likes to do that to His people. And He loves to bring honor and glory to His name. It makes Him happy to do that for sinners in Christ as they believe in Him. He has a never-ending eternal supply of grace. And He gives it to us every moment of every day we need it. We don't do anything without God's grace having something to do with it. He's reached out to deliver sinners because it pleased Him and because it shows off everything about who He is and about who His Son is and His Spirit are so that they would be praised and worshipped. He's a faithful God. Verse 12 talks about his faithfulness. In order that we, when Paul says we here, he's talking about the apostles, he's talking about the Jewish people, the first to receive the gospel, so that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. So that they would give Christ honor and glory, give the Father honor and glory through the proclamation of the gospel, through actually being obedient and following through with God's plan. God receives glory because he fulfilled his promises to the children of Abraham. And as Gentiles come to faith in Christ again, God's promises are fulfilled and he receives honor and glory and praise. As we spread the news, more people honor and glorify and praise our Heavenly Father and his Son, our Savior. Because God is faithful to his promises. And again, he will be faithful at the end of verse 14. Until the redemption of those who are God's possession. When we finally get to see God face to face, Christ face to face, either through rapture, 
resurrection, death, however it might happen. We are God's possession. We are going to see Him face to face. He's promising. We will be with Him for eternity. But you know, as much as I've talked about how much God has done for sinners, we still have a responsibility to respond to what God has done for sinners. Look here. In order that we who were the first to hope in Christ, they hoped, they believed in the gospel. You also, verse 13, were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when it was preached, when it was proclaimed, having believed, you were marked in him. God has done so much to bless us in that, with spiritual blessings. He has awakened dead sinners to be able to believe the gospel message. Every time the gospel is proclaimed, the Spirit uses it, brings it to people's hearts and minds, that they might be awakened to the truth of the fact that they are sinners and they need to be saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus, His Son. We have to believe. We have a responsibility as well. Somehow it's evil and Evil choices and God's plan works together. God's grace. Sin, sinners choosing to believe the gospel message. God works His plan to redeem and save sinners. And he works with us as we choose. God is an awesome and mighty God. Amen. We should praise Him continually because of our salvation. We should never stop. And never be ashamed to praise God for the salvation He's given. So as we wrap it up this morning, three things to keep in mind. Praise God for His salvation. You can't say it enough. Praise Him. He chose you in love because it pleased Him to freely and graciously bless you. You are pleasing to Him in Christ. That doesn't mean that we can just go and do whatever we want because God is not pleased by that, of course. Sin does not please Him. Sin keeps us separated from Him. As we choose to sin more and more, our hearts are gravitated towards that, then we walk away from God. Not eternally, but when we confess and return, it pleases Him and He works again in our lives. We continue to praise Him. Praise God for His salvation. It pleased Him to save us. Let us please Him by striving to live a holy and blameless life. Let us trust God's plan. If God can put together this very intricate, detailed plan that even utilizes the sinfulness and sinful choices of evil men and women, of Satan himself, and turn it around for his honor and glory and for our good, he can be trusted to handle the minor details of our lives, the things that we worry about each and every day. Trust his plan. Everything has and is and will work out just as God intends to bring everything and everyone under Christ. Even our suffering, our trials, God is using it. We're going to continue to focus a little bit more closer to home in the next couple of weeks about what it means to suffer well as a believer. But we had to go through all this to lay the groundwork for that. Trust God's plan. Sometimes He's going to lead us and ask us to do things we don't want to do, that we don't think we can do, that we don't think we are worthy of doing. I understand that. I've been there. And still struggle with that myself. I don't deserve to be up here proclaiming this message today. But God has called me. And I'm answering that call. No matter how nervous or scared I might be. And He can do the same thing for you if we are willing to step out in faith and be obedient and trust His plan. We also this morning live holy and blameless lives, confident that we are His child. You are a believer in Jesus Christ today. You are God's child. He has you. And nothing will happen to you that He does not allow to happen to you. And nothing will happen to you that He doesn't want to happen to you for your good. He can turn everything for your good, for His honor, for His glory. Nothing can change our status as God's children. Live in the blessings and responsibilities that are ours in Christ. And we will please Him more and more will bring joy and encouragement to each other through our daily struggles. And we will proclaim the gospel of Christ to a world that is desperate for hope, desperate for grace, desperate for salvation. Let us live.
as God's children. Father, we thank you this morning for these truths, for these wonderful blessings. And while this message has not even come close to proclaiming the truth and the magnificence of your plan of salvation, we thank you for reaching out to us, for calling us to be your sons and daughters. Help us to not get hung up on things that we don't always have all the details or the greatest information for, but help us to proclaim and stand united in the truths that we do have. That you have saved sinners by your grace through faith in Christ. We thank you, Father. Help us to live as your children. Help us to live in ways that do truly bring you honor and praise. Help us to proclaim the gospel message that others might believe and have the hope of salvation. Help us to be a church that is not afraid to go and to follow your will and plan. But it doesn't seem right and it seems like we're just not capable or worthy of such a calling. Help us to step forward in faith, knowing that we can trust your plan. We thank you, Father, for all that you have done for us. Help us 